is a designer. Can I see you at the end? I want to ask you something about what you do. Um, do you design anything that also is like timelines? I didn't hear your introduction. You, you said that I was at the Metropolitan Museum at one point? I was not an introduction. Yes, you were at the Metropolitan Museum at one point. How long a point was that? 18 years. <laughs> Henry Gelsoller, whose name is familiar to all who know or care about 20th century art, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he spent 18 years, to now New York City's Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. He has been immortalized from Oldenburg happenings to Warhol's camera. He's been carved by Marisol, portrayed by Hockney, cast by Siegel. Henry Gelsoller gives shape and form to our visual, visual and cultural life with uncommon vision and wit. I'm especially pleased to have you here, Henry. Thank you very much. New York is indisputably the art center of the world the premier training ground for new talents, and the most desirable show place for those already well established. Yet this has not been true for, yet this has been true for barely a generation. And that generation was when a vigorous native born movement burst forth in the 1930s and 40s. We're talking obviously about abstract expressionism the first such movement that was spawned in America. And for the first time, it gave New York preeminence over Paris. How did modern art come to flourish in well, America? Well, about a year and two months ago, I would have agreed with that opening. But now that I'm Commissioner of Cultural Affairs and I see the city from a broader point of view, I have to say that not only did America and New York flourish in the 40s and 50s due to a burst of energy, that uh, happened spontaneously in the 30s. Uh, but dance came to America at the same time in the person of George Balanchine, who came to America in the late 30s. And the uh, first work with Lincoln Kirstein in the ballet theater was in 1945 and 46. Uh, New York as a visual arts center is uh, complemented by New York as a dance center. It's, it's really quite amazing. Uh, I don't know how much art history you have, and I don't know I want to be patronizing, but I, I think it's quite clear that uh, what happened was World War II, what happened was WPA, what happened was government support of the arts for the first time from 1935 to 1942, which took the artist who was isolated and put him on projects where he met his fellows, where de Kooning met uh, Gorky, where, where uh, Stuart Davis met David Smith. And suddenly there was a sense, not of a lonely American artist working somewhere in a garret, but a, a sense of, of uh, people who were involved in the same activity, had the same interests, and had the same problems. They began to group themselves in cafes and in bars because artists love to talk about themselves to each other. It seems to be the the history of art in the last 120 years is the history of artists telling each other how good he is, each one telling the other one how good he is. Uh, at the same time, the uh, horrors of Hitler brought Leger and Duchamp and Dali and Chagall and Seligman and Mondrian and Bella Bartok and Balanchine, goes on and on to live in New York. New York was a cosmopolitan city had been forever, but suddenly was a cosmopolitan city of artists who were mature and who were working in New York. And I call it talismanic, it's like knocking on wood. All of a sudden, a veil fell from the eye of the American artist, and he said to himself, you don't have to go to Paris to paint a good picture. Leger and Mondrian aren't worse since they got to New York. They're painting their best pictures here. Maybe you can paint a masterpiece in New York. Maybe you can dance and leap and, and uh, pirouette in New York as well as anybody can in Paris. These guys didn't get worse here. And there was a kind of freedom about it. And a, the, the direct contact through the few galleries that, uh, like Peggy Guggenheim, that showed both the Europeans and the Americans so that uh, a, a Max Ernst met a Robert Motherwell and, and the contact became one of friends, uh, also helped uh, 
pull away the veil, uh, the scrim that was in front of the American artist. And he realized that uh, world-class art was being produced in New York. Why not produce world-class art in New York? Along about the same time, you burst forth on the scene, too. No. How did you come to <laughs> flourish in New York? Hitler, too. I came. <laughs> It's true. Barbara Rose calls me the, the youngest refugee art historian. Uh, I was born in Belgium in 1935. My parents came to New York in March of 1940, got off the boat in Hoboken, immediately realized we'd made a mistake and took the path, I think, over here. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in the uh, Upper West Side. Uh, I went to public school 166 and 89th Street. In Amsterdam. Then I went to Joan of Arc Junior High School, uh, 93rd, and Amsterdam. And then my parents began to get scared because uh, the schools were beginning to get a little rougher. And they pulled me out of that and stuck me at a place called Horace Mann up in the Bronx. And I cried and said, I don't want to go there. It's for spoiled sissies. I want to be with my friends. And uh, within a year, I was elected president of my class. And I graduated from there and went to Yale. While I was at Yale, I decided that I wanted to be a curator. It's a weird thing. My parents said, no, no, a lawyer. Where did you ever get the idea of a curator? You were a volunteer. I volunteered the summer of my sophomore year. I wrote a letter to uh, the Dean of Education at the Metropolitan Museum volunteering my services, which, which were the services of a 19-year-old. They were you know, almost nil. It was, actually, when I look back on it, it was kind of a chutzpah to offer myself at that point. The Dean of Education wrote to Yale. They said, this guy's all right. I spent two months there. I got to know four or five curators, one of whom later became the director, James Rorimer. I then finished Yale, spent a year at, in Paris at the Sorbonne, three years at Harvard getting a PhD in teaching. And during my third year at Harvard, I found out that the director of the Met had been following me year by year through these institutions. And every year, getting a report that he hasn't gotten any dumber or whatever it is. And he came to see me because he was on the board of overseers of the Fogg Museum at Harvard where I was studying and teaching. And he said, would you like to come and work at the Metropolitan Museum? And I said, no. And he turned pale with rage and said, why not? I said, because I'm interested in contemporary art and you're not. Can you help me get the job at the Whitney? <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? I said, you're an encyclopedia. An encyclopedia that is skipping a volume. The 20th century is not being collected. You can't go into the 21st century having skipped the 20th and, be, and continue to call yourself an encyclopedia. The fact that the Whitney, the Modern, and the Guggenheim are collecting is very interesting. Unless they're absorbed into the Metropolitan Museum collection, they might leave town, they might fold up, they might sell their assets. Anything could happen. There was a time that the Whitney and the Metropolitan considered merging earlier on, as you may recall. Uh, we'll go into that. Also, uh, there, were, there have been various stages along the way. Anyway. He said, maybe you're right. And he wrote me a letter asking me to come and see him when I was in town for Christmas. I did. He offered me $5,000 to come as a curatorial assistant in the American Painting and Sculpture Department. I called what my was the American Painting and Sculpture Department at that time? It had been founded in 1949 by angry artists who were protesting that the most important museum in America was ignoring the living artist. And there were two funds set up in 1909 and 1911 called the Hearn Funds, which generated about $15,000, $20,000 a year, which was more money than any museum in the country had to buy contemporary art. And the money was being used to buy the brother-in-law's, sister-in-law's, cousin's schmata that was in the basement. There was no uh, unity about it. The artists got together, and they wrote a letter to the New York Times, and they picketed the museum. And in 1949, the museum hired Robert Beverly Hale, my predecessor, who was a teacher at the Art Students League and is close to 80 now and is the premier teacher of artistic anatomy in the world today. As a matter of fact, his teacher was taught by, was taught by, was taught by, directly to Titian. He is, he is a student of Titian, a contact like student formulation. of Titian. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, wait Bob. a minute, Bob Hale, who was a very sweet gentleman, but a little bit passive, was told by the director of the Met that this young fellow was going to be attached to his department. And Bob is too polite to say, I don't need this whippersnapper. So he let me come. And I had an office in the American Painting and Sculpture Department. It was basically 19th century American art. Except, don't forget, by 1960, Bob Hale had bought the Pollock, Autumn Rhythm, 
Before we get to that point, let's backtrack one moment so they can have another kind of historical perspective. My father paid my rent the first two years, by the way. You want to know how I, how I lived on $5,000 a year? Um, at the time the Museum of Modern Art was being founded, Arthur Davies kept on complaining that there was no institution, no place for collectors of modern art to leave their pictures. Because according to Davies, they were stored Anything that was left to the Met that was considered modern was stored in the Met's commodious basement. Is that correct? It's true. The Museum of Modern was founded in 1929, but you also have to remember that Gertrude Stein <laughs> left her great portrait by Picasso to the Metropolitan Museum because she said in her will, I can't leave it to the Museum of Modern Art because museum and modern don't go together. It's just not, it's not, it's just not, a, it's not a phrase, Museum of Modern Art. But all the while, there, the uh, Metropolitan was being somewhat a derriere guard. They did hold a post-impressionism post show in the early 20s. I think it was 1921. How did that fit in to their philosophical scheme of things? By 1921, post-impressionism was uh, kosher. What, what happens is, uh, it, if you have cubism, which looks like it's shattering the world, what they call it, an explosion in a shingle factory. It was called by a, a critic in 1912. If you have cubism, then what happened just before it suddenly looks very calm and classical. And I, I think it just seems natural in the history of taste in the past hundred years that uh, every new avant-garde breakthrough pacifies the public about the previous one. So by 1921, post-impressionism really wasn't a, a very hot issue. The Metropolitan also showed Cezanne before the Museum of Modern Art. Well, the Museum of Modern Art was founded in 1929. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum, by a rare fluke of history, had Roger Fry, the great uh, British uh, art critic and lousy artist, as curator in 1910-1912 uh, because J.P. Morgan wanted him. And he finally quit saying, that I can't work for this man, he's impossible. And he went back and, and did those great shows in London called the Grafton Gallery shows that introduced post-impressionism to the English public back in 1910 and 11. But we had Roger Fry in New York uh, at a time when if he'd been allowed to, he could have created a, an amazing uh, collection. In, in fact, it would have preempted yeah. the necessity for the Museum of Modern Art. So there we are just about 30 years ago in the formation of a department of 20th century. When well, you're talking to the audience, how do you know how much they know? They know, I know a lot. I know. So a lot. But we'd like to bring it up to date chronologically, wouldn't we? Yes. So here we are in 1949 and the establishment of a department of painting. And let me explain why they picked Robert Beverly Hale. He was related to the trustees as a cousin. He's a Marquand. Uh, he's J.P. Marquand's first cousin and the hero of a Marquand novel. He is a cousin of Buckminster Which Fuller. Novel? I can't remember what it's called now. I'll find out. He's a direct descendant of Margaret Fuller, the transcendentalist. He is a, a Hale like, uh, like Nathan Hale and uh, those We Hales. have the provenance and we okay. understand the point. Also, <laughs> he was teaching at the Art Students League. He lived in East Hampton and he was friendly with Pollock. And he was perfect. Uh, he, he, the trustees felt as if they could dine with him and yet... Comfortable with this. <laughs> yeah. And yet here was this guy who actually knew artists. And what Bob did, uh, I call him Bob. I'll tell you a story. And, and when I first came to work for him in 1960, he's a very depressive man. He, he was sitting there like this at his desk. And I've been there for about three days. I came in, I said, Mr. Hale, what's the matter? He said, Mr. Hale, Mr. Hale, it'll be Bobby next week. <laughs> <laughs> I promised myself that I would you call him, him Mr. Hale. After, <laughs> after that. For years and years. And years. I've only learned to call him Bob recently. Uh, what was my point there? Uh, he was acceptable to the trustees, could converse yeah, with artists, so he was three the, years, bridging the gap. 1950, 51, and 52, he did exhibitions of first painting, then sculpture, then watercolor and What was the first exhibition drawing. of that department, do you recall? Oh, I'm explaining. He did three annual exhibitions in 50, 51, and 52. First painting, 50, sculpture, 51, and drawings and watercolors, 52, in which he cast the widest net possible, from Wyeth to Pollock, from uh, Chaim Gross to uh, David Smith. Uh, it was a I cover the waterfront kind of approach, which is exactly the opposite 
approach to which I took in 1970 with my New York painting show. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> but it was philosophically, perhaps, at that moment when the Metropolitan Museum was first dipping its toe in the water, uh, the, correct, the correct thing to do, to say, uh, look, we are babies at this. We're not going to try to tell you what has quality and what doesn't. We're going to show you the full complement of what it is that Americans are doing in the visual arts. And those are the, the, those three shows. And in what year did you come to the Metropolitan? July 18th, 1960. And James Rorimer was the director. And I said to him, uh, what shall I do? He said, there isn't much contemporary art in the building. I said, I take that as signal to continue my education. And he said, it was. I went down, and this was the most frightening moment of my life. I got to the office at 9 o'clock on the morning on a Monday in July of 1960 at 9 o'clock. By quarter of 10, there was nobody there. I called my sister-in-law in Riverdale in tears. I said, what should I do? There's nobody here. She said, they probably don't get to work till 10 o'clock. Don't worry about it. At 10 o'clock, in comes in a man called Albert Tenneyck Gardner, who is a great scholar of 19th century art and a very hard worker who produced catalog after catalog. The opposite of, of Robert Hale, who was a poet and a dreamer and a uh, rather passive personality. And here I was, this young curatorial assistant, generally assigned to a department that had one guy working in the 19th century and one guy working in the 20th. So Al Gardner, whom I didn't know, called me into his office and said, first I want you to help me finish the 19th century drawings catalog, and then we're going to redo the sculpture catalog. And I said, oh, my voice breaking. Mr. Rorimer, that's the director, uh, assigned me to work on 20th century art. Let's discuss this when Mr. Hale gets in. If I hadn't, I'd still be in the basement there. <laughs> <laughs> but at age 23 or whatever it was, I, I, looking back on it, it was a very brave moment for me. Uh, it was a moment when I just had decided that I wasn't going to be... There are two kinds of curators, and we need them both. There's the uh, librarian, uh, church mouse, uh, adder of information bit by bit, who has no ambitions in the world except to leave it a slightly tidier place than he came into it. And there's the other kind, which is like me, uh, perhaps uh, more of an educator, more flamboyant, more of a communicator. And I think I make no distinctions in value between them. If I didn't have the backup of the research of a lot of other people, I wouldn't be able to be very clear about my facts. On the other hand, if you didn't have communicators, those facts would lie there uh, on shelves and get dusty. So I, I think both are necessary. But it would have been death of my spirit to have been stuck in the basement with, with the 19th century. Well, after you spoke with Mr. Rorimer, in what direction did he cast? He left me alone, and I made up my mind that my first job was to familiarize myself. So you and really I, did complete your education? I did. I did. I went out, and in the first two months, I met Frank Stella, Larry Poons, Kenneth Nolan, Helen Frankenthaler, How'd Andy Warhol, that? Jim Rosenquist. Who was the initiator of those associations? Ivan Karp, who runs the OK Harris Gallery, was working for Leo Castelli, and Dick Bellamy was about to open the Green Gallery, and the three of us were in constant touch with each other, had nothing but time in our hands. Every time we saw something we liked, told the other, and were constantly schlepping back and forth. I had well, the joy the three of... three of you obviously helped launch not only many ideas, but many careers. It's funny. People talk about us discovering this and discovering that. You don't... You didn't say discover, you said launch, and I, I, I'll agree with that. It's the discover that I read in the, in the press that makes me nervous, because, you know, Columbus discovered America. America knew it was there. Uh, if I am call up Dick Bellamy to say, I'm in the studio of Larry Poons, and he's just made a fantastic breakthrough, come on down. The evening, the third time I met Larry Poons, First he was painting like Mondrian, then he was painting less like Mondrian, then all of a sudden I went down and there was a green painting with red dots on it. And I just, my heart sank. I called Marisol, Ellsworth Kelly, Frank Stella, and Dick Bellamy. And within two days, everybody was down there. I had bought one for $400, and Larry Poons had a show at the Green Gallery six months later. The, the excitement, there's a book by George Kubler uh, of the Yale Art History Department called The Shape of Time in which he describes the concept of entrances. There's a happy entrance and there's an unhappy entrance to be made. If your peculiar talents are suited to an age 
and you, your career begins at that age, then you've made a happy entrance. And he talks about art, within art history. You could be a, a naturally Rococo artist born in a neoclassic age and not know how to fit in. Uh, I've always said, and this is not wood, I guess this is... This must be not plastic. <laughs> yeah, but I, I have been very lucky in my entrances. I, I, I entered the Metropolitan Museum in 1960. I had the joy of introducing uh, Lichtenstein to Warhol and Rosenquist to Wesselman and uh, Stella to Poons. I, I was there, I was the right guy at the right time, being paid a salary to educate himself and to move around quickly, which is what I did. And it was fabulous, it was unbelievable. Henry, here you were raised to speak French, Flemish. You come to this country and 20 years later, rather than your interest in the most classical of periods or art, it's not only American art, but of the most avant-garde. How do you explain that? Well, I think my, uh, the safety I felt and the judgments I made, in the, ju the safety I felt in the judgments I made, uh, right or wrong, was based on a very thorough grounding in the classics. And the fact that I had gone to Yale and Harvard and the Sorbonne, the fact that I had not only been taught the history of art, but had taught it myself several times, uh, made pop art and the new abstraction look not at all shocking to me, but like rather the natural next step in a series of causalities that could be explained quite easily the day you looked at them. I didn't come in from left field. I came in through the historical way, and I, I think that uh, the fact that I, I was, I'm unshockable by an artist has to do with the fact that I know the, the history of art. The long sweep of history. But did you ever expect the media to proclaim what was then called pop art in the fashion that it did? Do you think it helped accelerate the well, movement? The media, God bless it. I met Andy Warhol in July of 1960. It took me two and a half years to get him an exhibition. He was turned down by Leo Castelli. It was too much like Lichtenstein. He was turned down by Sidney Janis. He wasn't sure it was art. He was turned down by Robert Elkon. I took Andy and his work everywhere. I brought all the dealers to Andy's studio. We have this image of, of the instant uh, success of this one and that one. Uh, in, in late 1962, and this was the origin of my celebrity, such as it is, uh, the Museum of Modern Art held a symposium on the question of, is pop art art? And they asked me to be on it, and I was this young guy from the Metropolitan Museum coming down to the Museum of Modern Art to defend the contemporary movement against the curator from the Museum of Modern Art, Peter Seltz, who, who was saying it wasn't art. And I said to Jim Rorimer, the director of the Met, can I go down to a symposium at the Museum of Modern Art and defend pop art? And he said, sure. On their turf, though. And I found out later, he thought I was talking about Pop Heart. <laughs> it was an illustrator. <laughs> you know, defend Pop Heart against what? You know? <laughs> Henry, did you feel obliged to match these emerging talents with galleries because there was no possibility of their being shown at your museum? Metropolitan Museum wasn't re ready for Pop Heart. You know, it's curious. I, I said this to the Times the other day. Uh, I thought when I changed jobs that I was changing jobs. Actually, we always end up doing what our fathers did before us, and we always do the same thing all our lives. We get divorced and marry the same person again. Everything is the same. At the Met, my job was to convince the trustees that the artists were serious. At the same time, to tell the artists, hold it, the trustees aren't ready for you. And that was exactly the story. And in the Koch administration, my job is to tell the mayor, the cultural life of the city is hungry and needs you desperately. And turn around and tell the cultural life of the city, the city is broke. Don't you understand? So it's that's good training is your, <laughs> for your mediator role. Let's uh, be discursive for a moment since you bring up your current role. I jump around a lot. I'm it's sorry. okay. No, we have continuity, but we're going to go with this. Uh, current role. Obviously, you've spent a, m all of your professional career in a museum. You are now a part of what is commonly referred to as the public sector. Other than the illustration you've given to us, how do they compare? <laughs> uh, again, I'm repeating something I, I've said before, but at the, to, when I left the Met, Ed Koch announced at a press conference 
Blanche, Rubin, uh, Blanche Bernstein was going to be the human resources, and five or six commissioners at a time. And one reporter piped up, how does it feel after 17 years in the ivory tower suddenly to leave it for politics? And I said, are you kidding? After 17 years at the Metropolitan Museum, it's a pleasure to get out of politics. <laughs> a good line. A what year does it later. Mean? A year yes. later, what does it mean? It's still true. To know that you have the borough president of the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens out there. To know that you have the Hispanic artist and the black artist and the avant-garde artist, the off-off-Broadway theater, the community and neighborhood theater. To know that you have these constituencies that you have to serve, that you know you have a limited amount of money and energy that has to be balanced out before them is politically infinitely easier than sitting in a chair at the Metropolitan Museum as a curator and being knifed in the back by the director, by a trustee, by a colleague that you don't know what the hell could. The Byzantine atmosphere of a university, of a big company, Hoffman La Roche, I imagine, is the same. I think or there's a gentleman's agreement among politicians? It's out there. Like if, if I do something terrible, I read about it in the uh, uh, ethnic press the next day. Or I read about it in the village or the west side this or the east side that. It's, there is no... Um, there's no place to hide, and, and I like that. I like that. It's, it's, it's more frank and it's more open. At the Met, I refused to do the Andrew Wyeth show, and the result was Tom Hoving took my galleries away, and uh, the 20th century office in the basement. Why don't you tell us basement. how that all worked out? Who made the decision to uh, have the Andrew Wyeth show? How did that come about? Was it done because of a grant from an outside patron? Was it done as Let me a tell. It was 1976, it was the bicentennial year. And uh, Hoving had brought a breath of fresh air into the museum when he became director in 67. Suddenly it was much more collegial. It was much more a question of all the curators and colleagues. Before, if you wanted to buy something, only the director would know and he would bring it to the trustees acquisitions committee. Hoving instituted dry runs in which each curator, and there are 18 at the Met, would bring what he wanted to buy into the room, and we would all argue about it together. We would say there's $2 million to spend, there's $4 million worth of stuff in the room. The Egyptian curator was fighting the Islamic curator, the contemporary curator was fighting the, Medi the, the arms and armor guy. It was fabulous. Actually, so much of the money that's available for purchases at the Met is uh, directed specifically toward one thing or another, that we weren't fighting for the whole pot of money, we were fighting only for the general funds. Then the next week there'd be a meeting with the trustees and the curators who had passed their colleagues' test would get up and talk in front of the trustees and then you'd leave the room like school and the trustees would vote and you'd find out the next morning. That was kind of horrible. How has that changed? Um, at the same time in this collegiality, I'm leading up to the Wyeth show, he put together what he called a, an exhibitions committee so that the curators would know about exhibitions and vote on them uh, as they came along. I was put on the exhibitions committee because I was considered a generalist. I, I would often fight for the Greek thing rather than for my own thing. I, was, uh, I understand what an encyclopedic museum is about. One day, we could have a general staff meeting. Hoving comes in and says, great news, there's going to be a wire show. Hadn't gone through the uh, exhibitions committee. I was a little outraged. I thought, a wire show? In 1976, the bicentennial year, the biggest show ever given to a, uh, biggest one-man show ever given to an artist in a uh, city that ha houses Noguchi and de Kooning and Ellsworth Kelly. Uh, I, I don't know. I said, but on the, I was, I'm talking to myself. But on the other hand, I am the curator of 20th Century Art. If there's going to be a Wyeth show, I guess I'm the one who's going to do it. So after the um, meeting at which Hoving announced it, I went up to him and I said, uh, I guess I'm going to be doing a show. I went down and I spent two days with the Wyeths in Chad's Ford. They were as charming as could be. I was told that there was going to be a lot of material in the show. Did you not resist the before. idea at all? I tried to be open. I thought I have a responsibility not to prejudge. There's a lot of wife I haven't seen. Uh, there might be the possibility of making a show out of this material that no one has made before. I was told that there was a lot of material that had never been shown. I spent two days down there. Uh, Mr. Wyeth picked me up at the railroad station in a car, which was a Maserati, Lamborghini, uh, something or other. Car collector. 
and said it was, this car was given to me, and I quote, by my friend Frank Sinatra, at which point I thought something is wrong here. <laughs> but it's all right. I mean, uh, let me look at the art. His wife, they made uh, crab, which is my favorite food. I mean, it went on and on. Went back to New York. Then I went up to see Mr. But what and was Mrs. the work like? Uh, let me finish. <laughs> I then went up to visit Joseph and Rosalie Levine, uh, Joseph Levine, the film producer, who owned 50 wives and who were going to help underwrite the show, to see those wives, which was supposed to be the cream of the crop. That has a very good evening with them. Their, their chauffeur drove us up in a car that felt like butter, and we whined and died. Back to New York, and this sounds like an exaggeration. But Mr. Two, Levine is also the man who bought the house, the Christina's World right, house, right. and wanted to... He's a Wyeth um, connoisseur or a Wyeth freak, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> like, freak and connoisseur. Uh, it sounds like an exaggeration, but for two nights after that, I didn't sleep. I was in such agony. And I called Tom Hoving on, at 9 o'clock in the morning of the third day, and I said, Tom, I don't know how I'm going to tell you this, but I've got to call up Andrew Wyeth, and I've got to call up Joseph Levine. I cannot do this show. I can't do it. It's not good enough. It's not on good what enough. basis did you decline? I declined on the basis of there not being enough new material, that there had been a, a uh, Wyeth retrospective at the Whitney in 69, and that there was not enough new material to justify a yet bigger retrospective of the same kind of material in the bicentennial year, highlighting the fact that the Metropolitan Museum, the most prestigious museum in the Western Hemisphere, was putting its imprimatur on this man as the American artist of our time. I, I just couldn't do it. Tom that morning, Hoving, was very reasonable and said, I think I understand. Let's work this out. You've been here 17 years. You've never taken... How about a sabbatical? And I'll do the show. This was true. How about a sabbatical and I'll do the show? I said, Tom, I'm enormously relieved. I'll go to Europe and write a book. You do the show and the whole thing will pass as if nothing. He did the show. I didn't get my sabbatical. Uh, he forgot that part of it. Uh, I got punished uh, by having my galleries taken away and what not given back. What do you mean you had your galleries taken away? What does that mean? If you remember the 20th century galleries at the Met, you go up the stairs to the second floor and you turn left and there are five galleries. Just at the moment when I refused to do the Wise show, there was an Impressionism show coming at the Met, and they decided the only place they could possibly do it were in the 20th century galleries. They could have done it somewhere else. That meant that my pictures went off exhibition and into the basement. And uh, I'll never be able to prove in a court of law that there was a one-to-one -one relationship, but I, I certainly feel that the result of my refusing to do the Wise show limited my uh, the loudness of my voice in the upper councils of the museum, who felt as if this was a big winner, was a big uh, money maker, uh, they were going to sell thousands of reproductions and millions of people were going to come and see it. As a matter of fact, Hoving actually said to me, I said, why do the same show that was done in 69 at the uh, Whitney? And he said, if a musical comedy is a hit, you revive it, don't you? I said, do yourself a favor and don't repeat that. You come to a very fundamental <coughs> issue, and that is the kind of conflict that most museums face this, these days because of their own fiscal crises that you are more and more familiar with in your present role. There is that conflict between striving for larger audiences and the quality that we hope they want to convey. How does one balance the two? Well, there are those who say the Metropolitan Museum has gone too far in its merchandising, and there are those who say that its ability to mount exquisite exhibitions is indeed funded by the merchandising. Uh, and what would a, you say? As a trustee of 26 institutions, I am now ex officio, which means by virtue of my chair, uh, on the boards of all the New York City institutions you can dream of uh, that get or funding from the city. I don't want to judge the Metropolitan Museum. I would say that the amount of energy and the amount of uh, capital that it takes to produce the revenue that they get is getting a little out of hand. Uh, I think it's perfectly legitimate for a uh, uh, 
cultural institution to be revenue producing to the point of, to the extent that it can be. I think there there are points of vulgarity. I think a uh, King Tut necktie is vulgar. Uh, it's just everybody's sense of vulgarity stops somewhere else. Uh, I read the board m minutes of a Lincoln Center. Uh, board meeting last night, this is off the record because the board minutes don't get published, and they're wondering how it is that the Lincoln Center constituency can, I want to say cash in on, can participate in the kind of uh, income that the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art are making out of selling reproductions. What is the Metropolitan Opera, New York City Ballet, a Beaumont Theater, and a New York City Opera, and a Chamber Society uh, do to have a, what do they have in a store that's the equivalent? And that's the way they're thinking at Lincoln Center. In other words, it's, it's become part of conventional the wisdom among, mentality. well, conventional wisdom, let's call it, that, uh, that it's getting more and more expensive, that, that, you know, in 1964, there was no National Endowment on the Arts. 1964, there was no New York State Council on the Arts. 1976, there was no, 1976, there was no Department of Cultural Affairs. My department came out of the parks, uh, where it sort of sat quietly for 100 years. The federal, state, and city funding of the arts is something new. Uh, the tax laws have benefited the institutions for years. The inflationary costs are, are spiraling. Curator salaries are becoming much more in line with uh, their colleagues in academia. Uh, every cultural institution is under terrific pressure to uh, increase its revenue in all ways possible. And I, I won't make the judgment that it's wrong to have a, uh, a sexy catalog or a, or a jazzy uh, a jazzy store in the museum, as long as it's kept in perspective, uh, and that the the public, visually and verbally, is led to understand that what we're doing here is supporting what it is that is our mission, and that our mission is not to make money. Is all of that governmental presence and funding a good and desirable thing? I think the various mixes that it takes to keep a, uh, insti an institution going are very healthful, salubrious. I think uh, single funding is dangerous. Single funding is potentially fascistic. But if you have corporate and foundation and private individuals and the city and the state and the feds, and you have an economy that's changing all the time, tax laws that are being adjusted, governments that are spending less or more, private individuals who have more or less money, you have a, a kind of a mix, which is a, a natural uh, sensor on any one sector taking over the intellectual content of any of the institutions. I like the mix. In Europe, they have a different system. In Europe, you can't deduct from your own personal taxes the value of the gift of a painting to a museum. Uh, the, for instance, in, in, in Berlin, I spent some time in West Berlin, the government of West Berlin gives the museums $2 million a year of tax money to buy works of art with, but they don't allow the individual to deduct from his taxes the gift of a work of art. Uh, they say it's one or the other, you can't mix them. We have an incredible system in America where the individual is encouraged to give, the corporation is encouraged to give up to 5% of its profit before taxes to uh, health, social welfare, education, culture, uh, as well as uh, getting federal, state, and city tax money back. We, we have the best of all possible worlds. If you could we're, still, we're still broke. Yeah. If you could remedy New York's leading cultural deficiency, what would it be and what would the remedy be? My goodness. I would be, I guess, as a New York City official, I think the fact that, one, that the budget of my department is one-sixth of one percent of the New York City expense budget is a bit of a scandal. One sixth of one percent of the money that uh, the city spends gets spent on our cultural life. That's twenty-six million dollars. Curiously enough, on an exercise in a plane to Washington a year ago, I figured out the National Endowment on the Arts and Humanities. If you add them up and take the total uh, federal budget, which is half a trillion dollars now, comes out to one sixth of one percent of the federal budget. It seems that there's something ingrown, inborn in our culture that feels that culture is worth only one sixth of one percent. I think that with triple the amount of money I have, which would be three sixths of one percent or a half of one percent, I would be able to do a hell of a lot to help emerging institutions, to help. Uh, 
local community groups in every planning district in the city be able to put the same kind of floor under the Whitney and the Modern and the Guggenheim as the Met has and the Explain Brooklyn Museum has. Explain to us what that means, the same kind of floor. The Metropolitan Museum and the Brooklyn Museum are in city-owned buildings on Sit Park land. I give, through my department, $5 million a year to the Metropolitan Museum and $2.5 million a year to the Brooklyn Museum. The city is responsible for cleaning and maintaining and protecting those institutions because it owns them. It's responsible for capital improvements. If the roof goes, if the elevators go, that's in the city capital budget. That's what I call putting a floor under. The private sector owns the collections, in other words, the trustees own the collections, and pay the intellectual staff, the educational staff. We pay the guards, the uh, curators are paid for by the trustees out of endowment funds which have accrued over the years. Therefore, the city builds the platform and the private sector determines the dance. I think it's a wonderful mix. It's my job to keep those places open and clean and safe and well lit as many hours a week as possible. It is not my job to go in and tell them what it is they should do. And when the New York Times calls me a czar, S-C-Z-A-R, in a headline. Is it the uh, spelling or the well, idea in, that you in, object in, to? Uh, Purist crossword you puzzles, it's T-S-A-R, because I can't deal with a Z. Uh, <laughs> czar is a four-letter word that fits into a headline. I am not in any sense a cultural czar. I do not go to Balanchine and say, enough not crack, let's do Romeo and Juliet. I don't go to the Metropolitan Museum and say, a little more Monet and a little less... Uh, it's just, I mean, that would be a culture czar. If I'm anything, I'm a facilitator. Uh, my job is to make it easier and more smooth, more... more, uh, more oiled for uh, a, a Latin dance company that wants to be forgiven uh, a, uh, a rental fee at a city-owned institution like uh, Carnegie Hall. I can make a phone call and help with that. Uh, I can well, we get know you need more money, but you need more facility, too. Do you have enough authority? to carry out your really far from I have enough authority with regard to Ed Koch's ear. Uh, I don't have enough mandated authority probably in the city charter, but that's a very complicated legal question that we go into. But if I had the money, I would take Lincoln Center, the Whitney Museum, the Modern, the Guggenheim Museum, uh, I would take the Joffrey Ballet, I would take... How much money do you need for all of this? I could do it for 75 million instead of 26 million a year. Plus, I could give enough money to the Latin and, and, and black and neighborhood and avant-garde and off-off Broadway and the little struggling groups in Queens and so on. Not to support them completely, I would never want to do that. I don't want them to be funded completely from one source, but enough to leverage corporations, foundations, the state, and the feds to come up with more money. Well, for a city that takes such great pride in calling itself the cultural center now of the world. Ed Koch calls, calls my department the flagship of the city. Well, what are we doing to fuel that flagship? What Remember the Nino, the Pinto, and the Santa Maria? <laughs> uh, is New York still the cultural place to be? Is it the fountainhead or is it the marketplace? In the visual arts, nobody else has replaced us, but we aren't as exciting as we were 10 years ago. In the visual arts? In the visual arts. In the dance arts, we are the hottest thing in the universe. Uh, in music, people, quite sophisticated people who've lived in Paris and London and New York say that New York is still the most amazing. New York is the only place, I've, I've lived in London and Paris and Rome. New York's the only city in the world where you feel as if you can reach out and not touch each side and reach up and not teach, reach the top. After three months in London, you've seen the plays, you've seen the operas, you've, you've seen the art galleries. Somehow or other, you've comprehended the culture of London. The culture of New York City is endless, it's vast, it's incomprehensible. At 15 hours a day, six days a week for 14 months, and I'm not stupid, I still don't know everything that's going on out there. Henry, and that's the excitement. You sound an alarming note. You say that it's not as exciting as it was 10 years ago. Is it because of the very nature? Is this course basically about the visual arts? By and large. Um, I remember when I was that narrow. <laughs> uh, is it because, A, you know so much about the visual arts? B, because the very nature of what is going on in the visual arts is more charitably no, des described us. as a question of plurality and diversity? The fact that more people live in different areas of the United States now? 
Barbara Lee and I have a problem. We did a program once together on television, and I talk so much that she can hardly get her questions in. <laughs> no, you're doing wonderfully well. No, I always want to answer your question as you're asking it. Okay. This time, I let you answer. I let you finish it. No, it's my own ossification. I'm 43 years old and I can't see anymore. Not true. Not true. Uh, Let's try again. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't everybody always, has he gotten up? grown older said it used to be better when I was younger. Sometimes I'm afraid that there's an element of that and I don't think there is. Uh, I think uh, there's a moment of enormous high-pitched excitement which wouldn't be that moment of enormous high-pitched excitement if it wasn't in contrast with other periods and I, I think that well, something happened. Well you're saying that happened. it's not happening in general in the visual arts or it's not happening in New York? No, I think it's not happening internationally in the visual arts. Well, I don't see it. That's a very different impression. Oh, than, oh uh, I see. I just don't see it. And I, I travel much less than I did because uh, the mayor likes to have me at the end of a telephone wire, which I like. The secret to this job, by the way, is the closeness to the mayor. If there were ever any strain between Ed Koch and me, if there were ever a feeling that I couldn't call him up and get him on the phone, walk into his office and ask for something extraordinary, somebody else had better be the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. It's a, it's a real mayoral agency and the city is run in a way in which the mayor gives responsibility to his commissioners to run their areas and he doesn't interfere. And there was even a case, which I can't be specific about, of someone who helped him in his campaign and they wanted help from my department for a grant and he said, that's the commissioner. If you think that helping me in the campaign is going to get you some special favor, then you elected the wrong guy and you helped the wrong guy. On the other hand, he tells you, you make a big mistake. Your job is on the line every day. You earn your spurs every day. No one is a commissioner here forever. Let's talk about a job of yours that was on the line. We left you in 1976 on your non-sabbatical. What happened after the Wyeth show? Did you get to do many shows at the I, <laughs> I crept back into something we call the airplane hangar. It's a, a gallery 200 feet long uh, on the northeast corner, which was built for oriental rugs. has no skylight because light is bad for rugs. It was never used for oriental rugs. And from time to time, that would be open. And I would put up the big paintings. I don't know if any of you ever were lucky enough to see them there. But I had a 65-foot um, Ellsworth Kelly that he gave to the museum, a spectrum, uh, which I asked him to do for the 1970 show. I commissioned it without paying for it. And he gave it then at the end. Let's talk about that 1970 show. Anyway, I crept back into little corners of the museum until I left. I, I never really got back into the... Uh, upper reaches of the administration. Now we're creeping back to American painting and sculpture, 1940 to 1970. Um, David Hockney designed the suit for me last summer. I'm very proud he of He is it. very pleased with his new It's It's the Humpty Dumpty self. look. <laughs> you know, is that a the, reminder? In the American movies, the sheriff <laughs> wears the belt down here and the belly hangs over. Uh, I used to dress like that. My friend David Hockney, who's drawn me very often, said, that isn't how you're going to look good. And he, he had me wear... I don't know if you remember that your children's illustrations of Humpty Dumpty always wore uh, suspenders exactly like this. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just pointing that out to you. It's an, it's an aside. <laughs> American painting and sculpture, 1940 to 1970. An interesting, newsworthy, controversial exhi exhibition. Tell us the genesis and the reception of it. Are you familiar with the catalog? It's, uh, what happened was, the Metropolitan Museum was founded in 1870. The Centennial was in 1970. There were five exhibitions. Uh, I originally was to do the fourth. One Saturday afternoon, I got a phone call at home from Tom Hoving, eight months uh, before the show finally opened. And he said, we're having trouble with the Mexican government. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. We're having trouble with the Mexican government, and we can't do the Before Cortez show first. Will you do your New York painting and sculpture show first? In other words, in eight months instead of in two and a half years. And I said, give me a minute. I put the phone down. I didn't hang it up. I put it down and I thought, can I do it? And I picked up the phone and I said, on one condition, would you let me hire Kay Bierman back from Leo Castelli? 
She had been my secretary. She had then become Leo Castelli's secretary. I said, if I can have Kay Bierman, who knows insurance and shipping and bills of lading and lists and details, and let me sit down and think out the show, I can do it. He brought Kay back. Kay became my assistant curator. When I left uh, the museum, she's now working for me as head of institutional services with the city. So I have 19 years now of, of the same loyal staff. What happened was, I decided that for a celebration, what could be a better celebration than a celebration of quality? And what I was going to do was, by myself, try to determine what was the best American art produced between 1940 and 1970. Not out of pride, but out of not wanting to share the responsibility for whatever my mistakes were with anybody else. I was not working in a vacuum. I was working in a consensus. I knew Clement Greenberg. I knew Dick Bellamy. I knew Harold Rosenberg. I knew all the artists. I knew how they felt about each other. And I sat down, and I made lists, and lists, and lists, and lists. And uh, began to think, what is it you, Henry Galdella, would like to see again that you've seen before that would excite you? What combinations of things would you like to see that you've never seen or anybody else has ever seen before? And they gave me the entire second floor of the Metropolitan Museum. They took out Cezanne and Monet and Rembrandt and Van Dyck, the whole thing to put in Coons and Flavin and Warhol and Rosenquist and Lichtenstein and de Kooning and David Smith and Clifford Still and Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko and Philip Guston and Bradley Walker Tomlin and Joseph Cornell and Jules Olitsky. It was 43 artists I decided on. I also decided you can't tell Bupkis from one work of art. So I wanted rooms. I wanted rooms where you could walk in and be surrounded by Gottlieb or Motherwell or Joseph Cornell. I had 22 David Smiths. I had 25 Joseph Cornells. I had uh, a room of Ellsworth Kelly drawings. He had always refused to show his drawings before. I said, I insist they're masterpieces as he showed them, they and they have become uh, very well known. The week before the show opened, John Kennedy in the New York Times, front page of the Arts and Leisure section, wrote, rumor has it that Henry Galdola's New York painting and sculpture will be the biggest boo-boo of the year. The week the show opened, there were four articles in the Times attacking it, by Grace Glick and three by um, Hilton Kramer. My father called me and said, the Vietnam War isn't being covered like this. <laughs> in the foreign press, in California, in Europe, it was hailed as the triumph of American art. In New York City, it was universally despised. Emily Janauer on television practically wished me dead uh, about the show. How do you explain show. that? Was it because it they easily. knew so many of the artists? So many personal loyalties Absolutely. involved, glaring omissions by their lights? Glaring omissions, uh, Robert Indiana, Larry Rivers, uh, Louise Nevelson, Herbert Ferber. Everybody had a best friend that I hadn't put in. Everybody had a, uh, uh, a social world that I had excluded. Everybody had a uh, collection that they put together that I was undervaluing, they thought, by not including it. I knew all this was going to happen. I lived through it. I'll live through worse. I lived through something just as bad last week. We're going to get to that any moment. Well List making is never a very satisfactory task, no matter what form or shape it takes. But if you had that exhibition to do over again, let's do a little revisionistic art history. Who might you exclude Ooh, in the long sweep this is, of history? This is as bad as who I left out. And who might you <laughs> include on second chance? It's pretty good to have a second chance to redo that show. I would ask myself much harder questions about Dan Flavin that I'm not absolutely sure about. Uh, I would include the work of Raoul Haig, hmm. whom I didn't know was an active sculptor at that time. Uh, I would think very hard about Ruben Nakian and probably have included some work by him. Uh, I would waver a bit on Bradley Walker Tomlin, who still strikes me as a magical artist but who perhaps isn't in the cause and effect relationship in the history of art that I thought that I was involved in in there. I think maybe what he was was a maker of beautiful pictures at a given moment. I'm not sure. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I like that show. I'd like to see it again. You may get that chance. In fact, you may get that chance in one of your future incarnations. What would you like to do next, Henry? 
Oh, I don't know. Ford Foundation, Metropolitan Museum, stay with Koch 12 years, uh, all kinds of things uh, flip through the mind. For the moment, I am happy and working hard, uh, perhaps harder than I ever have as Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. I don't feel as if I've made the impact on uh, the cultural life of the city uh, that Ed Koch has expected of me yet, and I expect to stay where I am at least through his first term. Uh, as for next, I'm 43 years old. I'm uh, midway actuarially for somebody uh, who is born in 1935. So uh, uh, I don't know. Would you like to go back to the Metropolitan Museum? Not as a curator. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it means that under the aspect of eternity, subspecie eternity, as they say, I can imagine myself in a dozen years coming back as the combined director and president, perhaps, or uh, something completely, I just don't know. I can imagine going down to Washington in another administration and doing what Liv Biddle is doing. I can imagine all kinds of things. I can also imagine inheriting some money and going off and writing books, uh, living in a shack in Vermont, or, or uh, all, all kinds of things. You think, I, you think I need public approval too much? <laughs> and she didn't want to miss you. <laughs> um, do you need public approval too much? I am like Ed Koch in the sense of, how m I don't quite say how am I doing, but I need a lot of stroking. Most of us do. Uh, in a recent speech honoring Allen Ginsberg, you obviously felt that he needed a lot of praise too, because you announced at that time not only your praise of his work, but how good he made you feel in his work, and at that time, you announced your own homosexuality. I wonder if you could tell us what... What, what day of the week is this? Today is Thursday. It was a week was ago it tonight. Just a week ago tonight. I wonder if you could tell us what repercussions, if any, your candor has had during the course of this well, week. Well, let me tell you what happened. I was invited by the National Arts Club to give a gold medal to Allen Ginsberg. I was on stage with Norman Mailer, William Burroughs, John Ashbery and Allen Ginsberg, quite a heady crowd, all old friends of mine. The New York art world is such that the poets and the musicians and the dancers all know each other forever. And I read a speech which included, I happen to bring it with me, um, do you have a few minutes? Please. Do you have a few minutes? Yes. It's not a long speech, I just want to tell, I want to tell it like it is. Poet of New York and New Jersey, Walt Whitman, Louis Zukowski, William Carlos Williams. Poet of America, Gregory Corso, Jack Kerouac, Peter Orlovsky, Neil Cassidy, William Burroughs. Poet of the West Coast, San Francisco City Lights. Poet of India, Buddha, Dharma. But finally, if mid-career can be termed final, the poet again of New York. New York City, the East Village, Tompkins Park, the St. Mark's Poetry Project, New Yorican Poets Cafe. Poet of sexuality, the poet of politics and anger, the poet, poet of pacifism and meditation. Allen announced to the world that you can be homosexual and inclusive. He is a poet whose truths are described so feelingly and tellingly that their particularities became universal. A poet of human sexuality. We all feel as we read Allen Ginsberg what Allen Ginsberg feels. It is easier and more palatable to be an American and to be a homosexual because Allen has stood up and spoken out. His eloquence allows us to share his victory. There is a lot of love and a lot of wrath in Allen's poetry. The love is light, it shines and breathes. The wrath warns of Armageddon and warns off Armageddon. His wrath at the America of the Vietnam War and the 25 most involved corporations is headlong, unmincing, and cathartic. Poetry to heal, to burn, to burn off impurities by daring to isolate their horrors in precise imagistic language. Alan's final message, if I dare, is acceptance and meditation and inclusiveness. In my name and the name of the city of New York, I'd like to thank you, Alan Ginsberg. Now, is that a speech in which I get up and say I am a homosexual? At the end of the speech, uh, somebody else got up and spoke, somebody else got up and spoke. And around 11.30 at night, I get a phone call from the New York Post. I'm back home in bed. Uh, our stringer says that you said that you were homosexual at the National Arts Club tonight. Do you realize that you're the highest 
uh, official in this history of the state and city of New York ever to say such a thing. You deny it. And I said, wait a minute. Let me read you what I read. I said, it's, thanks, Alan, for the possibility of being an American and a proud American and a homosexual during difficult times. If you're asking me whether I am myself homosexual, I'm not going to deny it. However, I do have no intention of being the free, Betty Friedan of homosexuality. I'm going to lead no crusades. My public life is a matter of public record and concern, and my private life is going to remain the way it is. Next day, page six, New York Times, Geldzoller, uh, Post. Post. So what did it say? Gelzoller? I didn't see it. I can't remember. Geldzoller says he's gay. Uh, and then the article goes on to say that it was a very brave move, that nobody else had ever done it, put it in context of my remarks about Allen Ginsberg and Betty Friedan and et cetera, and uh, it all calmed down, except in my immediate family where my parents are still hysterical. <laughs> True. And the reason I was a little shaky when I came in, I just spoke to my mother, who said, you're making your father sick. I mean, it's, uh, it's like that. You're 43 years old, and you can still be manipulated by uh, parents. It's, uh, it's difficult. Who was your most successful show, Henry, and by what standard? New York painting and sculpture, no question. Is there any exhibition that you haven't done that you'd really like to? No, but I wrote an introduction to that uh, New York painting show in 1969 that what I would like is a permanent exhibition in the city of New York. I don't care where it's housed, at which museum, even at a new museum, that shows to every foreign visitor, to every American from out of town, to every New Yorker who wants to know, to everybody who wants to judge, against the best that's ever been made, a permanent New York painting and sculpture, 1940, 1970.